Yeah, the region of the continent uh, of um, Aramea is true, but it's not really connected by it. Uh, so the true Spanish is in Alsace, but it's a total um, gap. So that's why I'm saying the other two is double. If you double spread it, it's more natural. So the SIRMA is about to leave to capture both Tiger and Aramea. Permanent leakage, permanent depression of SIRMA. That's what SIRMA is doing. Um, so those two things to temper the proportion of the of the time. Then I make a few then it's in it's in tem tempora like a transient between SIRMA and IRMA. Uh, I can go to like a little perfect perfect system without doing the target and I may SIRMA and non or partial I can go to the target of SIRMA in a very rigid natural go over it again because the articles are also in the final exam and they, they are important they, they can go into a little more detail to to remember so it is important just to okay this this can I pause right now what's perfect the first so you, you will of course I will tell you what which article I'm asking you what so the first one is about the stability everything is functional we didn't deal with that so the target to capture the final yield so the first one is the perfect the ligand binding sites to final yield sites in NMJ receptor can bind like this. The ligand binding sites in NMJ non-MMA receptor can bind like that. See that see that slide? Is that right? E and J and even and J and correct. So uh, the NMJ receptor can bind NMJ and GCN and the non-NMJ in the article says you are too receptor the two proximal pair uh, they interact with each other the amino acid is left in aromatic ring so it's called two and two it has an aromatic ring two and two that means again mutation to an amino acid that's left in, in aromatic ring cause what that's the good question it could be the factor rate of uh, the perfect deactivation it has a factor it has a cost and now the question is to which direction step back, what is the role of the aromatic ring in the interferon of the NMJ receptor? This is another optional exam. What is the role? It binds the glutamate. It binds what? The glutamate. No, not the glutamate. The glutamate is uh, the other side of the, the, the pathway, so it's where the, the ligand binds. But pyridine, the interferon is enters what we call the hydrophilic, how they call it, Of the amino beta peptide is what? 
don't think we can produce a lot of uh, proteins, so we still consume a lot of fat. The question is simply because it's because we have we have a lot of large amount of proteins in order to study structure and function. So going down the chain is the classic type genetics. And going up the chain uh, is the what we call the reverse genetics, and it's maybe more frequent today because we have tons of databases that we can look at uh, with uh, structural features, elements, and then try with truly uh, uh, hypothesize based on previous knowledge. We know that in organism A, uh, the particular gene does that, so this is would do a similar same thing in another organism. And so we produce, um, using a genetic manipulation, uh, a mutant of your own, and then we can see what happened, what, what effect did you induce, either behavioral or morphological and so on, and we do this by a different protocol of gene activation. So again, the, the, first, the classical genetics and the reverse genetics exist in the literature, and then I think I think some studies will even go both ways, but uh, basically, I think it's we put things in order uh, conceptually. So manipulating genes is an important part of genetics in general today, and uh, we will mention some of the protocols we have to manipulate genes. And let's start even before the overview with some terms for uh, term genetics. Okay, so alleles are different forms or variants of a gene. Each gene different uh, unique different characteristics um, and they are called alleles. Genotype is the set of alleles for all genes that are shared by all the individual. So as I said we got all the, the particular alleles we have for each and every gene. You can see it's studied with, with genotypes and the genotypes give rise to a phenotype, a set of physical attributes or traits not necessarily physical that an individual will have, and as I said, they are the consequence of the gene. Okay, so the genotypes in studies also uh, refer to when they change, change something, they manipulate something that they change, they have a, a necessary a set of physical attributes, more likely one physical feature that, that they change, for example, the molecular retina, as I told you, so this would be the, the phenotype that the researchers go through for them, or change them. Okay, the wild type is the normal, non-mutated allele. Usually what we mean here is the most frequent allele in the population. Yeah, so the, I'm not sure what normal means, so it's the most frequent allele in the population, in a defined population. And mutations, so different alleles are sort of mutations of one another, right? But we don't call them mutations. Mutations we usually only use uh, when we try, when we know that there was some uh, mutation that was newly formed, so in, in, a, in, a, in a population or in a study, and then we call it a mutation. Okay, so it's, it's basically a, a new allele or a mutated allele. And a mutant gene is any agent, can be a molecule or a UV uh, radiation or whatever that causes a, a heritable change in the DNA sequence, something that will go in another generation. Okay, we, we will talk briefly, uh, go over briefly on, over these points, the analysis of mutations to identify individual genes. DNA cloning by recombinant DNA methods, and then characterizing, in characterizing cloned DNA that will uh, produce here, and then a bit about wild, uh, genome-wide uh, birth system-wide analysis of genes. So first of all, the old thing about diploid and haploid in uh, uh, cloning outcome refer to mutations. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that for most, if not for all of you, these terms are already familiar, so I thought to go over uh, briefly about them. So complex multicellular organisms, we are complex multicellular organisms, for instance, are diploid, which means that they have two copies of each gene. All right, so it's, and that's again, not be confused with what we talked about alleles. Alleles are different forms of the, of the same gene in a population. But because we, we are diploid, we can have two alleles, two different alleles in our genome um, as part of the population, but we can have two alleles in each for, the, for the particular gene. Okay, so they can share the identical allele. Ah, this page. I'm 
then they will be called homozygous or uh, particularly, so because both are just alleles, homo means similar, or they can be heterozygous if they share two different alleles for the same mutation. A recept in a receptor mutation, the individual must be homozygous, but sharing both identical alleles for a particular gene hold the different alleles to show the different phenotype. It shows a difference of the of the of the can be measured outside the physical world. In dominant mutation, the individual is sharing one U2 and one Y type allele, so this is called heterozygous. Okay, so in, in this table, it summarizes the different combinations for the um, uh, Y type uh, and dominant, sorry, Y type and mutated alleles. So this is the, the situation in the genotype domain and how would the phenotype be affected in Y2. Okay, if you have both Y type alleles of a particular gene, the phenotype will be that of the Y type, right? If you have one mutated allele, but it's a dominant mutation, so it's enough for this mutation to have this single mutated copy for a mutant phenotype to be manifest. Can be both, and I'll, the next slide I'll try to maybe more biochemic, not biochemic, but functionally segregate between the two options. But for now, it's only what, I mean, what we look at the genotype, we do phenotype, and phenotype is basically satisfied. So this is the next operation. So this is just an example. It's enough to have a single copy. Uh, if we have a single copy of a receptor mutation, then the other copies sort of compensate for the first one, and we have this single the Y type phenotype. And if we have both receptor mutated alleles that we have, we have nothing to compensate for the first one, so we have the mutated phenotype that we get. Okay, so this is the same equation. Okay, I think, so regarding your question, the receptive mutation is usually the result from an inactivation of an affected gene, right? Due to changes in the promoter or in the promoter structure. We, we can talk about what happens in here, but typically both come from the same gene. And we talked about inactivation of affected genes leading to a partial or complete loss of function. So, it's a partial or complete loss of function that, so you have you have two copies that can produce a protein, right? So for these plot, for these mutations, the, the, the intact uh, alleles, the wild type alleles, produce an, a, a proper protein that is enough or producing large amount en um, large enough amount to produce to still give the function that the body needs, and so you have no phenotypic. In opposed to a dominant mutation, which may increase in the activity, which may increase the activity of the encoded protein or confer a new activity on it. Maybe the most the emphasis should be here. So if you have a new function of a protein, either because it's now localized to a different cellular compartment, or the protein is now secreted, or it now does something else, work on a different substrate from the wild type, then even if you have the proper wild type allele, it will not affect, it will still preserve the mutated phenotype, right? It will not be able to compensate for this new feature that this mutation will produce. So we usually functionally talk about, again, increase of activity of an encoded protein, new activity leads to inappropriate spatial or tem uh, uh, where it is localized or temporal pattern of expression or when it is uh, expressed. So these, all, all these cases would be dominant because the other wild type allele will not be able to compensate. Now dominant, okay, we now have a derivation. Dominant mutations may lead to a loss of function as was the case here, a recessive mutation, when both alleles are required for normal function. In some cases, we need high enough amounts of the protein and both alleles are translationally active. And so uh, even, even if we already identify the loss of function, not necessarily, uh, it, it will be a recessive mutation, might also be a dominant mutation. So the real dominant and recessive mutation, right? And the, the, is the recessive mutation, is the idea of a recessive mutation that it will result in a recessive gene, or is that it's a type of mutation? It's a type of mutation. Of mutation. So we're talking about a recessive mutation. The genes, the, the, the genes them are, are not recessive or dominant. Now we're talking about the mutation, not from a pair of genes or different alleles. It, we're, we're not talking about interacting between different alleles uh, in a population, right? 
sense because then you don't also can't think about the person and what they might do and partial kind of sense something like that so there's no point of talking about fear See, and that's what kind of is really it's, yeah, it's pretty much the same you see you can use them except they are there but okay but these are limitations and interactions between uh, the mutations so we're talking about the first mutation that we have uh, as we said as we as we as we define and then the mutation that we have uh, and we're going to get give rise to something because this is just a name of the journal given even as an idea for the, for the molecular assignment for the assignment of, of the course it's, it's called gene uh, genes brain and behavior but that's what other journals are there they have tried to link between whatever happens in the genome and some behavioral and, and um, neuronal functioning um, or other some might call it what, what is called psychogenetic So we talked about several pathways in that case, right? There's the um, um, uh, pathway of uh, vision and, and, and other ways of retina and so on. How do these pathways get discovered? The order of events, so how do they, how, how do, how do they, how do they discover? So partly by the following uh, protocol or, or way to, to do it is by double mutation that enable the origin of two regions that, re that remain that are members of the same pathway, A and B, and we know that the mutation in A gives repressed repress disorder expression. The reporter is anything that has down certain structures in the pathway, anything that duplicates it. Uh, if, if we're talking about uh, fibrosis or, or other pathways that were mentioned. So A, mutations in A give repressed disorder, reporter expression, less epigenetic level, mutation in B gives contributed disorder expression. So it's easy to find two components that have these two key elements, the origin effect and, and the pathway. Now we do, we give a double mutant, a double mutation in the same experiment. And we get two possible uh, outcomes, two results, and each one has just one possible interpretation of the order of the two components. So if the outcome is that Double mutation in A and B gives repressed disorder expression, repressed the same outcome as the single uh, mutation in A, then we would have to say that A has a more direct effect on the reporter, and we would have to say that A comes after B. So otherwise, the, it, this would be so we, would, we would have to show that the B would be downsaturated, we would have to see the effect of B. This is actually the second possible result. If we get a continuity, meaning a high, regardless of any cumulus reporter expression, then maybe this B is more directly uh, connected to, to the downstream, and this would be the case. And then you can, you can do one experiment after the other and gradually build the whole thing up to the next level. And the same reporter? It's a little bit dependent on how you define a pathway. Uh, yes, I'm not sure I have a good answer. I'm sorry. But usually, the, the, so another assumption is that if, if you have more things in there, it's But still, it's, it's not going to take us two years, by the way, to get the order of the results. Okay, DNA cloning as a fundamental unit of the course. Just a principle of how this whole field works. So DNA cloning permits researchers to prepare large numbers of identical DNA molecules. It's not clear these large numbers, again, to get a, to be able to take it up the structure or to use this DNA molecule as a probe. For instance, 
transfer, which is a transcription of the charge. And the third is connection marker, which is literally a drug resistance gene. Because after you in you insert this uh, ve vector uh, into a host cell, some of the cells in the population will not have this, uh, will not incorporate this, uh, will not insert this plasmid um, in 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 the genome, or even will not incorporate them into the cytoplasm. And so, if you treat this population of cells now with any uh, an antibiotic, or you think that this gene is an antibiotic. then any cell that will not have this gene returning in it will, will die, and any cell that had this resistance gene will proliferate, and you will be left with a population of cells where all of them express this different gene. And again, this is given to you on the bridge of the, the sketch. So if you, if you see this, it will start with a plasmid vector, and again, it's fragment, clone them together with the, with the enzymes and, and ligases, and with these ligases, and then inject whether, okay, so never mind if transcription or infection, but you push these DNA fragments into cells. Some cells in the population will not have, will just, will not take this inside, and they will be, they will not be able to replicate or die upon uh, addition of, of an antibiotic or another drug, and only those that have it will, will survive and proliferate, and then you have the final step is that you, you have a colony of cells that each of them contain copies of the same recombinant plasmid, and now you can just break down the, the cell membranes there and collect your DNA, and you have huge amounts of recombinant DNA. In the case of the genes of the probe, it looks similar to this. This was the electronic by recombinant DNA method. So characterizing the human DNA from the other segments and also manufacturing. First, genetic electrophoresis, which we studied, allows separation of the vector and the clone segments because they are still linked together and need to isolate the one from the other. Clone DNA molecules are sequenced separately by really tens of different sequencing protocols, super. So they have to have a lot of sequencing resolution. The immune sequences will not produce in chemistry today to sequence very rapidly and very effectively and, and Almost no errors, errors, uh, sequences of, of all of three organisms, uh, in a matter of minutes or hours. Uh, and so you will not hear any of that today. And these are really, really interesting chemistries around exactly what's happening there. It's still chemical wise, but um, um, you can read about it. And we will only introduce the, the most old fashioned by very effective and easy to explain physiologically, very easy, the DDL, nucleotide superspace protocol, uh, or what is called the DDL chain termination method. Just for you to be con convinced that you can sequence DNA molecules, and then you really really have tons of different uh, ways to do it, much more effective. Okay, so about this DDL chain termination method. DDL to nucleotide is what you see right here. It's one oxygen left in the three prime carbon uh, from a regular DNA sequence. A DDL sequence is the nucleotide precursor. Okay, DDL sequence, one left oxygen, is what we have here. And when you do this change, it's a synthetic, it doesn't exist endogenously in, in, in organisms. We do it synthetically. But when you have this, what's I inside the cell or whatever, it, it doesn't affect the incorporation rate of this molecule into the growing chain when DNA replicates, but it does affect the next nucleotide and not able, uh, the next nucleotide will not be able to link to this one. So the outcome, again, DDNBC can be incorporated into the growing DNA, but can I, cannot form the next uh, bond in the reaction. So we keep have, having products that only use this molecule right here. Okay, for the DDG sequence, for instance, which we do it on the DD guanosine superspace in a during the DNA replication. So this is the reference template DNA, and this is the one that you let uh, grow. This is the one that keeps, that is growing in the replication. 
and you, you, okay, so if you add it up of this to the effect being um, a large replication to occur, that's what actually ends here, where the G, the, the big ubiquity and uh, incorporated, others will end here, others will end here. Also note that you have to have a regular, not big B entity, but G ubiquity in your system, so, I mean, okay, so otherwise all of them will stop in the first occurring G, right? So you have to have high amounts of the regular G with these big GPT and low levels of big B GPT. And you do this separately, but the same for three remaining nucleotides, A, C, and D right here, and you keep using low concentration of the big B entity. Okay, and then from, from each test you do, you can run on SGL with a nucleotide resolution uh, difference and you mark, and you mark the intensities with different colors. What you get is actually ridiculous because each spot will have peaks of just one of the nucleotides and not so many of the others. So in this order of peaks, you can actually do this. So it's all, it's all about playing with the ratios for both your testing. By the way, for the intact part, for the cassette, the tablet, I'm not sure if you can clean it before I'm using it yet, but I don't think you have to do it now. Because if it's still there, so if it runs, it will be in the first few, sorry, in the last, in the, in the, in the end part, the end part of the gel. So it will affect these intensities. And for the second question, so I think they use, um, I think they usually use one-to-one -one ratio we try to use ratio that gives, that I think that assumes one replication per genus segment. I think. Is it necessary? What? What do you say? Right. And 100 micromolar from the DNA polymerase. So you use less DNA by its molarity. I mean, this one builds on. should play with the ratio to give uh, it just that usually they have one replication per DNA segment. And then you have some other things. Yeah, definitely. It is it's I'm not sure if it's the more as well. It is because for, for each spot you have to have just one peak, right? And if you play with the ratio is good enough so you don't have any you know it's not that one one length of cell actually be produced in a more biased manner than, than you know the longer length for instance and then you might have this this source of, of profile that you have more of this product than the other but even if you do you can normalize it pretty easily because it's a, it's a regional bias that you can just you know you know take i don't know take 15 generators and just normalize it locally but and you do see different product biases for different right you have mo what do you mean what, what does it mean that you have more of this p than this a this is, these are the same molecules, it should have been the same. So maybe you have different effects or efficiencies that happen in this test tube compared to this one, but still each spot will have one major peak. Okay, and if you have both, both peaks, then you have a problem. But when it is just it, it, when it is different test, it does happen that sometimes one peak doesn't recognize one from the other. I'm not sure which is the nucleotide and which is not. You get an end. Electa, the other companies that will do it, uh, and, and their claims to you know, have different efficiency and not to use DNA molecules. Okay, so this is just a bit about characterizing. Um, and just a few words about genome wide analysis of, of genomes. Um, and also here, and I took up quite a lot of slides, but just one, uh, one story that I want to share to show you. Uh, has to do with the NS1 gene. So this is a, this is a 
human being, you will probably be associated with a, with a very uh, sedentary disease called neurofibromatosis, also called the elephant man syndrome. Not very politically correct, but <laughs> because of the bump that appears in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so this is NS1. And a region in NS1 was shown, uh, that, that, that it, it was discovered to have considerable homology, considerable similarity with a yeast protein called IRA. And also, okay, so for this we have a feeling of what we talked about homology between IRA and NS1 given a yeast gene. We're looking at the amino acid sequence level, not the nucleotide level, nucleotide level. Yellow is everything which is identical amino acid. And blue dots here are amino acids with similar characteristics, hydroxyglycerin, uh, lactulin, different characteristics that we mentioned. It's an algorithm that allows gaps in both the reference and the not reference protein, so you might have gaps here, you might have gaps uh, also in the black sequence. So it's a local alignment algorithm. And this is a fairly good homology when you, when you compare humans to yeast. Yeast is ruled by, by an omen or an um, or origin. Yeah. Very, very similar to one another. You can put a p-value on this as well, okay? So that's not necessarily so why do we care if it really resembles IRA? It allows us to study in a, in a yeast, uh, uh, in a yeast system, and we, so we, we did that and we studied that IRA is a gap, it's a GTGM accelerating protein, which we know exactly what that means, affecting the monomerase G protein, we also know exactly what that means, right, which is BAT, or Bart family gene. Later on we saw the NS1 in humans does it does the same thing function in a similar way, which was discovered to be a gap as well, that uh, um, affect or regulate the efficiency of the RAS protein that has to do with uh, cell proliferation, and these are this is exactly the reason the uh, the reason for the for, for uh, increased proliferation in the peripheral nervous system that caused the bat the that appear in this in this syndrome. Okay, so this is one example based on comparing a genome between uh, yeast and humans uh, that allows uh, that allows researchers to get to get to the bottom of what happened between these two genes. It's very interesting, it's a it's a wonder we have lots of other examples of this. This can be identified within genomic DNA sequences using different scanning al algorithms. So nowadays we actually have genomes, full genomes of organisms um, Treatments of nucleotides, and you can actually identify novel genes. Genes that were not even uh, that were not known to exist until now. And the way to do it is to design algorithms that will search for certain features in genes. For instance, they will have to have something that looks like a chromoterism, to be precise. They will have to have an open reading frame, several tens or hundreds of, of nucleotides that can be read in one shot, and that will code for amino acids. Uh, they will have to have a starting point, so a start phenom and an end phenom, right? So all these features are sent or tangible to these algorithms, and you can then try to estimate, for instance, how many genes we have in humans. So a nice algorithm in humans gives the number of 35,000 genes in, in that in human, to humans. And it's interesting, because while any other factor during the years will search our uh, period of the last decade or, 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 or so goes up, so the number of genes in humans actually goes down and we started with about 35,000 and today we, we can talk about 25,000. So these numbers that, that we talked about are actually different outcomes of this, of this algor algor algorithm and it really depends on what we, are, what we call a gene. Uh, so these numbers are really, you know, they have to, no one needs to try again fight for how many genes exactly, but what we actually call a gene and what are the algorithms that are used. I would say that in bacteria, for instance, a very naive algorithm is look, look absolutely valid and give very few uh, positive uh, negative uh, 
um, positivity, uh, or po positive as well. Anyway, it works like good. And in humans, it doesn't work that well. And it's partly because we have these electrons in, inside, uh, inside our, our transcribed gene. And the outcome is that we can read with a single algorithm the whole region from start to end because we have these regions which do not code for any amino acids. And so it's, um, it's much more problematic. And when you try to take into account anything else, we all re already know about splicing and so on. So it's, this is the, the, what gave us the new numbers of 35,000 genes or 22,000 genes, something like that. Okay, so we're, looki we're looking at here about a, a genome Neutrons we have compared to axons in bacteria, in protozoa, in fruit flies, and in humans. Okay, so we have the largest neutron. And then I let's read together one paragraph from the textbook. Again, it's a bit a bit of philosophy. And then I'll show you uh, two websites that are tools. and to uh, explore ideas of different mechanisms. But first of all, let's let it say. So humans and plants are sufficiently related to have most genes in common. However, largely non-functional DNA sequences, such as intergenic reading of neutrons, um, etc., easily the meanings that are in between the start and end side of the gene or between different genes, we tend to be very different because they are not always functional like this way. We may have no spores, and the nucleus what supports them to remain uh, as they are with no changes. Thus, corresponding segments of the human and mouse genome that exhibit high frequency love, they are likely to be functional for the human. Okay, now this is, I think, a bit, uh, it's, it's a problematic argument in, in the following so if it's functional, and if, for example, it looks the same uh, between mouse and human, so, so if it's indeed it's functional, so what gives the human the unique phenotype? And, and indeed the answer later came from non-coding RNA, which perhaps is not selectively preserved, preserved but is functional, only we did not really know how to read functionality in humans. And now I'm talking about microRNA transcripts or uh, splicing regions that are intergenic or electronic. Uh, and all these features that in recent years are studied more and more or just in, in much deeper uh, way. And now we do know that they are actually functional. Again, non-coding genes, but still intensively functional. And not only that, but they are the ones that give the separate phenotypes of mice, monkeys, humans, and so on. Uh, so it was sort of a prediction that was made in the 90s, uh, even that the sequences uh, of, of, the, of functional in a device, the differences between monkeys and humans usually be studied in the non-function, the non-coding regions of the genome, simply because the coding regions are too, uh, too much alike, yet too much the same, uh, and will not be able to explain them, are not able to explain the, uh, the different you know, organisms, different cognitive abilities, for instance, between the birds, or between the monkeys, and so on. OK, let's have a, a last set of examples for non-coding functional RNA uh, initiatives. Right, but so that's true. So promoters are also might, might play a part there. I think promoters are, for most of the neuronal genes, also, uh, on average, very much alike between monkeys and humans. Yeah. So it's mainly microRNA or post transcriptional regulation. So it's pretty much, I mean, it's pretty near pretty much the same. You maybe you heard about the percentages of similarity between monkeys and humans, and it's the same if you are really 99% uh, monkeys. If you are, by the way, but, or even mushrooms, right? There are some percentages if you're 90, if you have the shared 90 or 90 of the same genes with mushrooms. So uh, I'm not sure how was how these percentages were calculated, but even if it's 
difference, uh, all it says is that the difference, the major difference between the Jacobian system and others, uh, it doesn't say any more information, it's already there for most organisms, so it's pretty much the same information, it's only expressed in different organisms, in different spatial and, and temporal uh, patterns. And it just gives the view of the different uh, uh, losses. So as you see, in this case, uh, what we have today, Sending is, is single. Okay, single. Uh, no, we are not mixed up with any sender. In the European Dino browser, we had the, the opponent, the American one, the UCL, UCL2, Russian uh, uh, UCL, UCLA, right? UCLA Dino Rescue? Yeah. Uh, okay, so you can go into this website, choose the species and uh, the table of species, the species genus, and because we studied the amino sequences of uh, the cognitive structure of these genes, uh, so you can upload it. We have the sequence here and um, the, this uh, strong action structure. Maybe you can zoom the event in a little bit more. Okay, and this, this is the one we're interested in. and the reverse of that, right? That's the strand. Um, so if we have the different protein and different RNA, different, different uh, information uh, sources in this website, so what is coded. So when we say they are color-coded, we have what is called a heterodot encoding, Lerch, and Lerch, and Lerch. So different, different sources, but principally you have, you, you are looking at the, the, the splicing splicing profile of this gene and it seems to be splicing in several different manners. We have evidence for some of them to be coding for protein and some for others we don't have. We don't have the protein for instance in the dog one protein structure. Um, so we have as if we have something like 10 or 11, even more, I think something like 15 beautiful axons so we can have several splicing variants. That's just in the first one. Okay, so our gene is this transcript. We can show you, we can just take a different gene of a different protein here. It's just easy that when the human genome is, is finalized and is processable, right? So then it's, it's, it's shifting up the list and novel sequences are, are discovered. So for each axon we take, for instance, we turned out to find that they have each are sequencing, sequencing the axon, for instance, in from one, two, for instance, when it comes to selecting the right gene, uh, it's number three, and for each of one, e each of them is number sequence. We study with it, so it's like in semi, in semi sequences, uh, whatever other sequences it, uh, it goes through. Okay, so this is a sample, um, beautiful proof here, but it's still for you to do this to test if you choose the way it is. And this then comes from GNAS, Jacobian Genome Rescue uh, GNAS lab, and it's a bit more complicated in that it, it has uh, also a presentation of a splicing uh, uh, element. Uh, okay, that's the immune suppressor segment. This is 